This is the second part of our discussion on complex trigonometric functions. In the previous discussion, we defined what are trigonometric functions in the complex case, of course. Uh, in fact, we defined them in two different ways. So, in one way, we use the series expression. In fact, we uh, took the series expression for real trigonometric functions and generalized them uh, to the complex case. And in the second definition, we used uh, the exponential functions to define uh, complex trigonometric functions. And we also uh, discussed some of its uh, properties. Now, in this part, we are going to continue our discussion and we will see some further properties of these complex trigonometric functions. So, let's uh, begin with our first property. So, one of the famous uh, property of uh, trigonometric functions that we used in our college about uh, sine and cosine is the following that you can see on the screen. Sine of x1 plus x2 is equal to sine of x1 cosine of x2 plus cosine of x1 into sine of x2. Now, uh, in the complex case, if we take uh, uh, x1 and x2 to be complex variable, in fact, z1 and z2, then the identity becomes sine of z1 plus z2 is equal to sine of z1 cosine of z2 plus cosine of z1 sine of z2. So, in fact, there is no change, not even a change of plus or minus. So, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's one thing that we are going to uh, do in our discussion of these functions that we will compare at each and every step the differences between the real case and the complex case. Okay, so in this case, there is no difference. And we also know that there is a, an identity involving uh, the cosine trigonometric function as well. And in this case, uh, once again, there is no difference between uh, the real and the complex case. Okay, now uh, you can see uh, these two different identities on the screen. Now, uh, if we want to prove uh, the cosine case, okay, so we want to show that cosine of z1 plus z2 is equal to cosine of z1, cosine of z2 minus sine of z1, sine of z2. So, for that, we will first uh, simplify its first term, cosine of z1 and cosine of z2. And in this case, uh, as I told you earlier, that there are two different definitions and we will choose according to the situation which definition suits us. And in this case, uh, the following definition suits us. Okay, so uh, we take cosine of z1 to be equal to 1 by 2 e raised to power iota z1 plus e raised to power minus iota z1. Okay, so, uh, so this is divided by 2 over here. Okay, so divided by 2. And similarly, of course, if we replace z1 with z2, what do we get? So, we get e raised to power iota z2 plus e raised to power minus iota z2 divided by 2. So, if we multiply these two expressions and simplify them, then we get the following expression. Okay. So, that's the answer of multiplying this cosine of z1 with cosine of z. Okay. Now, moving on to the next term, which is sine of z1 and sine of z2. Uh, once again, in this case, we will use the exponential definition. So, in other words, we will use the definition that sine of z1 is equal to 1 by 2 e raised to power iota z1 minus e raised to power iota z1 minus z. Okay. And similarly, sine of z2 is going to be equal to 1 by 2 e raised to power iota z2 minus e raised to power minus iota z2. So, using uh, these two expressions uh, in place of sine of z1 and sine of z2 and multiplying them, we get the following expression. Of course, there will be some simplification involved. Now, uh, adding these two terms, what do we get? So, we can easily see that this is exactly equal to cosine of z1, cosine of z2 minus sine of z1, sine of z2. If we add them, if we add this term and this term, then we get cosine of z1 plus z2. And once again, in this case, uh, we will be uh, using the exponential definition of this cosine function. And similarly, uh, we can prove uh, the sine case. In other words, first, we will simplify this side. And in fact, there are two terms of this side. So, first we consider this term and then we consider this term. And then we will add them together. And then we will see that this is exactly equal to sine of z1 plus z2. And once again, it will be useful if uh, you use uh, the exponential uh, definition of sine and cosine. Okay, so the definition that involves the exponential function. Now, we have uh, proved 
these two identities and uh, uh, once again uh, if we remember from our college studies that there are many consequences of these formulas or identities now let's have a look at some of the consequences of these formulas so one of the important consequence is sin 2z is equal to 2 sin z cosine z once again since the identities are exactly the same as the real case so that's why the consequences are exactly the same as the real case okay so we have used this identity for the real case many many times but it also holds for the complex case and similarly uh, the next identity cosine 2z is equal to cosine square z minus sine square z exactly the same as in the real case now uh, another important consequence is basically uh, calculating the relation between the sine and cosine for some uh, special angles so in other words the sine of pi by 2 plus z is equal to cosine z and uh, using the identity that uh, sine of z1 plus z2 is equal to sine of z1 cosine of z2 plus cosine of z1 sine of z2 so in this case uh, z1 is in fact pi by 2 and z2 is in fact z so what do we get so sine of pi by 2 plus z is equal to sine of pi by 2 cosine of z plus cosine of pi by 2 sine of z now in this case uh, we know that what is sine of pi by 2 so we can uh, calculate using either definition of uh, uh, the complex trigonometric function or even we can just take it to be uh, the real case because pi by 2 is a real number so we can just say that okay let's calculate it from the calculator and this is going to be equal to 1 now similarly uh, for the com uh, cosine uh, case cosine of pi by 2 we can calculate by using computer that this is going to be equal to uh, 0 okay so now what is going to be the answer so so this is going to be cosine of z and of course this term is 0 so that's a very simple proof of this relation between sine and cosine and similarly of course we can use that sine of pi by 2 minus z is equal to cosine z now uh, over here we use that cosine of pi by 2 is 0 and uh, uh, we took this as a real case now the next question of course uh, yeah, the next natural question would be what are the zeros of the complex uh, trigonometric function the complex sine and cosine function so this is going to be our next uh, task discussing the zeros of uh, the sine and cosine and of course this is the complex case okay now uh, let's uh, let's see what are the zeros so the zeros of uh, the sine function are basically z is equal to n pi where n is any integer okay and uh, uh, if you if you remember from the real case it's exactly the same as for the real case now let's see how to prove this thing okay so sine z is equal to 0 if and only if uh, z is equal to n pi where n is any integer now to prove this thing we consider z is equal to we take z is equal to x plus out of y okay and what does this imply so this implies that sine of x plus out of y of course this is sine z okay so this becomes okay so we have sine x cosine hyperbolic y plus out of cosine x sine hyperbolic y if you remember uh, we proved this uh, uh, identity in our previous uh, part previous module of these trigonometric functions so uh, the given thing is that this is equal to 0 and we know that uh, if a complex number is equal to 0 then uh, it's both the real and the complex part should be equal to 0 so this implies that sin x cosine hyperbolic y should be equal to 0 and cosine x sine hyperbolic y should be equal to 0 okay now uh, let's uh, begin from the left hand side so uh, we know that cosine hyperbolic y can never be zero okay so in fact uh, we can uh, uh, we will we will see its uh, graph and uh, let me sketch a very tiny graph of cosine y okay, so that's the graph and it's a real valued function because uh, uh, this y is a real number so that's why it's a real valued function and its graph we have uh, seen this in our college uh, trigonometric classes it's basically this uh, parabola type and this is never zero it will never cross this x axis okay 
Now, uh, if this is never zero, then this implies that sine x must be equal to zero. And of course, from our real analysis case, we know that this happens if x is equal to n pi. Okay. Now, uh, using this discussion, now I'm, let's use all of this discussion over here. Okay. Now, what does this imply? So, if x is equal to n pi, so cosine becomes the sine hyperbolic y equal to 0. And we know that, once again, n pi is a real number. So, cosine n pi is going to be minus 1 raised to the power n sine hyperbolic y. Okay. And uh, minus 1 raised to the power n can never be 0, of course. And uh, so, this implies that sine hyperbolic y is 0. And once again, we know from the graph of sine hyperbolic y, it's a real valued function. So, this implies that this is only possible when y is equal to 0. And let me sketch a very tiny graph of sine hyperbolic y. So, it is something like this. And from the graph, we can see that sine hyperbolic y is 0, uh, if and only if y is, equal to, y is equal to 0. So, using these values of x and y, so x plus iota y becomes, which is uh, basically a point where this sine uh, x plus iota y is 0. So, this becomes, so x is n pi plus iota y is 0. So, this implies what is the value of z? It is equal to n pi. So, that's uh, the solution of this discussion. But then, uh, we, we can't ignore this if and only if situation. It is not a one directional uh, statement. It's a two directional statement. So, we, we assume that sine z is 0 and we prove that z is equal to n pi. What about the converse? Okay, now uh, let me choose another color. So, if z is equal to n pi, the opposite side is basically n pi plus out of 0 and since y is 0 okay so this is if and only if this is if and only if this is if and only if and we can just go back like this so this becomes it is an if and only if statement if z is equal to n pi then it is very easy to see in fact if we don't go through this procedure we can just simply put z is equal to n pi in the in the, uh, sine z in place of z and we can easily calculate that it is zero okay so we, we don't have to go through all this uh, uh, long procedure even okay so that's uh, what we have proved uh, the zeros of sine z now let's have a look where are these zeros on the complex plane okay so let's say this is our origin okay so let's choose this point to be our origin and uh, n uh, z is equal to n pi so uh, let's say our uh, unit is pi so this is 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, up to so on. So, these are all of the zeros of sine z, which is a complex trigonometric function. Okay. So, over here, sine z is not equal to 0. Sine z is not equal to 0. Any, at any other point, sine z is never 0. And it, these are only points where sine z is 0 and they are on basically the axis or the real axis. Okay, so there are infinitely but all of them lies on the axis. Now, uh, moving on to the next case, uh, cosine trigonometric function. Okay, so cosine z is 0 if and only if z is equal to n plus 1 by 2 pi uh, n belongs to integer. Once again, it's exactly the same as for the real case. Uh, the proof of this is very, very similar. And I'm leaving this as an exercise. Let's have a look at these zeros on the z plane or the complex plane. Okay, so once again, all of these zeros lie on basically the real axis. Okay, so all of these zeros are over here. Okay, so all of these zeros are over here. And over here, we can say that cosine z is never zero. Over here, cosine z is never zero cosine z is never zero over here okay so these are the only points on the real axis where uh, this cosine z is zero and not at each and every point in fact they are very special type of points where this is zero and the proof of this is very similar to the sine case now talking about the differences between the real case and uh, the complex case let's talk about one big difference between the real and the complex case and uh, uh, the difference is in the real case, we know that sine x is a bounded function. Uh, the values of sine x or uh, the mod of the values of sine x is always less than or equal to 1. 
but in the complex case this is not the case and in fact sin z is an unbounded function now let's see how to prove that sin z is an unbounded function uh, we, we will see uh, the proof of the sign but before that uh, it's uh, exactly the same situation for the cosine x as well okay so uh, cosine x of course we know for the real case uh, the mod of the cosine x is less than or equal to 1 but once again in the complex case it's an unbounded function okay so that's a very big difference between the complex and the real case let's have a look at the proof for the sine case okay so we know that sine z is equal to sine x plus out of y if of course z is equal to if we are considering z is equal to x plus out of y and uh, using the identity we know that this is equal to sine x cosine hyperbolic y plus iota cosine x sine hyperbolic y mod square and we know how to calculate the mod of complex numbers it's the real part square plus the complex part square and there is always there is a square over here so that's why there is no square root so that's uh, next step and now adding and subtracting uh, two terms which is sine square x and sine hyperbolic square y okay so sine hyperbolic square y sine square x now basically we are adding and subtracting these two terms okay so this is the first term and the second term is basically over here okay so adding and subtracting these two terms and moving on and using the fact that cosine hyperbolic square y minus sine hyperbolic square y is equal to one of course this is the real uh, uh, case identity we have proved this we have used this in our real analysis courses and uh, using the fact uh, very uh, very famous identity cosine square set uh, x plus sine square x is equal to 1 using these two identities what do we get so we get that uh, the mod of sine z square is equal to sine square x plus sine hyperbolic square y okay now uh, moving on if we fix uh, the value of x to be x naught okay so our x naught is fixed so in other words we are talking about uh, uh, the points on in the complex plane okay so somewhere over here we are talking about the points on the complex plane uh, where x is fixed where the real part is fixed and we are talking about these lines okay so let's choose uh, one line x is equal to x naught and let's talk about the values of uh, this sine function on these lines okay so on this line we know that uh, y goes to infinity and y goes to minus infinity now if we uh, calculate the limit that uh, uh, y approaches to infinity what do we get okay so this is equal to sine square x this is constant uh, no difference in this uh, limit y approaches to infinity sine hyperbolic square y is equal to infinity now why is that uh, in fact we know that sine hyperbolic y is equal to e raised to power y minus e raised to power minus y divided by 2 and this is the definition from the real analysis course okay and limit y approaches to infinity sine hyperbolic y is going to be equal to limit y approaches to infinity okay so this is infinity e raised to power y minus e raised to power minus y and of course over here uh, we can easily see that this will approach to zero since y approaches to infinity and this will approach to infinity and it's exactly due to this reason that we get this identity okay so over here when y approaches to infinity then the mod of sine z square approaches to infinity directly implying that uh, the mod of sine z approaches to infinity which means that sine z is not a bounded function in the complex case and similarly we can show for the cosine case ca case and of course in this case we will first prove uh, the following identity and then we take the limit and on the similar lines we can show that cosine z is also an unbounded function in the complex case now in this part we discuss uh, some further properties of trigonometric functions this is the second module in our discussion of trigonometric function we will continue this discussion to our next module